I'm William O'Rourke. Um, I suppose what's the pertinent way to identify myself tonight is that I'm editor of the Notre Dame Review, since we're honoring the inaugural winner of the Notre Dame Review Book Prize. Um, so that's my claim to being here. Um, I'd like to thank, though I think and see if anyone's here from the press. Um, thank the Notre Dame Press for its involvement in this prize. It's a first book prize. Um, the um, Notre Dame Press has been um, an aid to the success of the creative writing program for its entire history. Uh, when I started the creative writing program here a long time ago, um, I wanted three things to happen. I wanted us to have a creative, graduate creative writing program. I wanted us to have a national literary magazine. And I wanted us to have a publishing series. And the publishing series was the Sandy and Sullivan Prizes, which the press has been involved with since 1995, which is the year Valerie Sayers produced the first issue of the Notre Dame Review. Uh, if any of you read the article that's in today's Observer, the student newspaper, that's the only typo I saw. They said that the Notre Dame Review was founded in 2013, which is <laughs> a real time warp thing. Um, and it was founded in 1995. But typos, alas, typos are always with us. And um, speaking of the Notre Dame Review, the new issue has just come out. And it always happens. I pick it up, I turn a page, I find a typo. <laughs> just curse that I live with. <laughs> and I won't go into the long story of why, because I used to be, when I was a graduate student, a professional proofreader. Imagine how bad I was at it. Anyway, um, the genesis of the Notre Dame Review Book Prize came about because I wanted to start a first book prize, the Sandine and Sullivan Prize, is Sandine, named after Ernest Sandine, um, a poet who was a professor at Notre Dame for many decades. Um, the Sullivan Prize named after Richard Sullivan, who was also a professor at Notre Dame for many decades, and also a, as Ernie was a poet, Richard Sullivan was a short story writer. Um, I wanted, um, we made that prize a second volume prize. And why I did that was to cut back on the number of submissions we would get, because we were doing this Valerie Sayers and I were the judges of, and still are, of the Sullivan Prize. And we knew we'd just be swamped if it was a first book prize. But a second book prize allowed us just to exploit the condition in American publishing where collections of short stories are difficult to publish. And um, we had a manageable, uh, neither of us at the time would consider it manageable, when we have to judge them a manageable number of manuscripts. So there was no first book prize because a first book prize, you would get hundreds and hundreds of submissions beyond the capability of any small group of people. Um, and two things happened, coincidentally. One, I was sitting around two or three years ago thinking, well, we should have a first book prize. How could that occur? And I was wondering how it would occur. And then James Redwood, sitting in the front row there, sent in a contributor's note after I had already published a couple of his stories, saying that a manuscript of his had been a runner-up in a Flannery O'Connor Prize. The Flannery O'Connor Prize is one of the oldest first collection, volume, short stories, prize in America. It's been well established for many, many years. And so the perennial, you know, light bulb, 
my case, one of the newfangled silver-like <laughs> <laughs> heavy light bulbs went off in my head. And it took a while to warm up because they always, <laughs> that technology takes a while to warm up. And I realized, oh, here is how I could do it. I could start a first book prize where the only requirement for entry was that you had already been published in the Notre Dame Review. Believe me, I thought that was clever. <laughs> I, you know, I have to reassure myself every once in a while that I'm clever. <laughs> anyway, so it was the coincidence of seeing the contributor's note from Jim and wanting to do the prize that I realized, okay, this is the way I'm going to begin the prize. I am going to contact him and see if I can get the manuscript that was a runner-up. And we will make that the first prize of uh, the Notre Dame Review Book Prize. Because I had already published five of his stories. And all the stories were connected to Vietnam. And um, so I figured, well, the others that were in the manuscript must also be that. And indeed, they were. And the idea that this collection of stories, Love Beneath the Napalm, was about Vietnam made me doubly or triply certain that this should happen, because I thought at this point, some 40 or whenever you want to date our involvement in Vietnam, there are various dates you can choose. Um, that there's a whole generation out there who needs to take a fresh look at that war, especially because of the wars that have followed. So, given that, I had all the impetus in the world to forge ahead. And with, again, the great help of the Notre Dame Press, you know, it, it has now come to be. So, this volume, um, Love Beneath the Napalm, is the inaugural winner. There will be other uh, Notre Dame book prizes in the future, but this is the first one. And it put me in mind of the first story I ever published of James Redwood. And it was, in some ways, an editor's fantasy or dream. Not, this doesn't happen that often in a life of an editor. I mean, I'm a number of things, but for the Notre Dame Review, I'm certainly an editor. And it was a story I picked out of the slush pile. And it's about, and not to say it's the only one, but it certainly was the first, because this was back in 2004 or so. I picked a story out of the, you know, it came, just came in unsolicited. And it was, happened to be the title story, Love and Infant Napalm. And let me find it here in the table of contents. So I can go to the page 63. And it was a story I knew I was going to publish after I read the first sentence. Here's the first sentence. Mr. Two leaned forward on his haunches and with the aid of a trowel gently dug out a weed which had insinuated itself between two of his pansies. Now, I've read a lot of things in my life and as soon as I read that story, I knew, I'm going to publish this story. I don't have to read another word of it. And for those of you who are students here and want to know why, it's the combination of the music and the vocabulary and the choice and location of the words. <laughs> Mr. To lean forward on his haunches. The word haunches comes from a certain kind of vocabulary. And with the aid, aid is important, of a trowel, which is important, gently, which is important, dug out a weed, which
which had insinuated, and that's very important and very expensive, <laughs> the word insinuated itself between two of his pansies. So I knew immediately I was in the hands of a writer who knew what he was doing. So I read the rest of it and immediately accepted it. It's a funny story. We have a box in the English department where we put the, you know, the stuff that comes into the review. Our, our graduate students who are, work on the review, they take it over to the, and I just happened to stand there. I was in the office and I saw a, an envelope there and I had taken the envelope out and just looked at it. And I don't normally do this. I had ripped it open and took the story out and read the first sentence. And then I took the story home. So then the next day I accepted it. Okay, that's how it happened and more stories followed. Now, Vietnam is a generational event, obviously. But, and as I said earlier, I wanted people, I thought there was a whole new audience waiting to read these sorts of stories. It's back then, where the anti-war people thought, why were we engaged in Vietnam? Uh, most of us thought it was because of the tin and the rubber and the oil. And that sort of thing is why we were engaged in <coughs> Vietnam. So it obviously plays you know, a large role in anyone who is my age. But that's why this coat is awkwardly hanging here, because it's a coat I own for a few years. And I just want to point out, there's a large green tag here, this, which says, Made in Vietnam. And even the most cynical anti-war person back in the 70s never thought it was, oh, exactly because we're going to enjoy the cheap manufacturing that Ralph Lauren will be able to you know, work out in Vietnam. Okay. Now, this book, I'm going to read one of the pre-publication blurbs we got for it from David Matlin, who is actually going to be reading here at the end of March. He says, Love beneath the napalm recasts the fullness of Vietnam's suffocating and cruel trouble. The stench of the war's horror is given a freshly enraptured perspective that never wanders far from the witch's breath of the violence and lies still calling to sorrows no matter how dispersed. The only witnesses who are truly free as the author states in these quietly alarming and necessary stories that really do take hold are wind and water. In this quote of David's, I always thought, because it's what I thought before this quote came in, was these are necessary stories. Besides their own literary wonders, they're necessary. I'll give you James Redwood. Thank you, William, for those very kind words. And, and thank you all for, for um, coming. Um, I, like William, am a teacher. And I've been a teacher since 1972. In fact, the first class I taught was in Vietnam, I taught some young people in Vietnam. I think that's what teachers do, is teach young people. And then you become an old person and you take a look at your students and say, I'm getting old. Or actually you say, why are they so young? But one of the reasons, one of the things that I would hope from this story, we were talking about it, I, I don't know if anybody will, will buy the book, it would be nice if you did, you certainly don't have to, but we were talking about the, the dedication page which I hope at least people will take a look at because you'll see what was at the time a young American reporter, a friend of mine, Dennis Trout, who died at the age of 65.
two years ago, and a young woman, North Vietnamese, who died in her teens, that's all I know about it. And both of these pictures, one for personal, well, both for personal reasons, but one of the people I knew personally, uh, struck, struck me, and it stayed with me. And um, I don't know, I mean, William was kind to say that these stories are, are necessary. I don't, I wouldn't call them necessary, but what I, what I hope would come from some of these, if you read them, is uh, the feeling that, well, okay, these are people I don't know, but you now suddenly I know them. It doesn't make a difference that their names are Vietnamese. It doesn't make a difference that they speak a different language. It doesn't make a difference if they're 50 years old or 20 years old. I don't think it, it makes a difference. At least I'd like to think that it doesn't make a difference. And so I'm going to read uh, at least part of this. I'm going to see if you fall asleep. I can tell from the story. And I have my dear wife here. She's very good at monitoring my habits, including the extent to which my mouth stays open for longer <laughs> periods of time than it should. And she's nodding off already. So I hope you enjoyed the story that I just read. Uh, but I'm going to read one called Mother, Mother Daniel's Rose. And I, I hope you enjoy it. Um, which was published, uh, William graciously published it in the Notre Dame Review. Brother Danny William looked up from his grating and peered over the top of his horn-rimmed glasses at the approach of his niece. Kim Helm was dressed in blue jeans and a light, blue a light pink blouse, much to his annoyance. A whiff of hyacinth perfume preceded her entrance into his little cell. One of about 40 ranged in a square around the courtyard of La Santa Maria High School in downtown Saga. The noise of the incessant traffic outside of Omni and Zoo Street the buses and motorbikes, the black Citroën 15 CV taxi cabs. Even the loud and smoky American military vehicles disturbed him far less than the appearance of the 17-year-old girl who stepped across the threshold. Helm, in Vietnamese, signified the rose, and there was a self-conscious blush on her cheek, which fully justified her name. Frère Daniel cultivated her. He now glanced down at the paper beneath his eyes and with a quick jab of the pen wrote unacceptable across it. Then he stared up at her. Where were you last month? Kim Helm flinched at his tone. Thunder began to roll in from the south across the Saigon River and a sharp breeze ruffled the leaves of a large K-pop tree in the middle of the courtyard. It was the beginning of April 1967 and the monsoon season had started, started early. Two of the other Vietnamese brothers, Frere Sebastian Chung and Kak Divian, bolted past the Cape Hop in search of shelter, the tails of their cassocks whipped up by the strong wind. <clears throat> Kim Hong gazed uneasily at her uncle. The smell of approaching rain hung in the air between them. Why at home, uncle, of course, but she peeped down at the floor. The room became dark suddenly and heated like an oven, and the fluorescent lamp on the wall behind Danielle's desk sputtered as it did every, after, every afternoon right before the deluge. Drops of perspiration broke out on the cleric's brow, and when Kim Hong glanced up again, she looked as though she was afraid that she too might begin to sweat. Fred Daniel rose to his feet and came around the desk. You were at Brodar's, weren't you? You were seen. Her blush deepened as she stepped back from him. Who saw me? She demanded. They have no right. She lowered her head a second time when her uncle gave no response. I was with friends, she muttered. But he was there, wasn't he? Kim Howe managed back another pace. Wasn't he? She peered up at him at last. But he was not with us, uncle. It was a coincidence. We went there from glass salafrades, and he was eating dinner by himself. How could he know we'd be there? Or, I'm sorry, how could, he, how could we know he'd be there? The bronze French clock on top of the PTT building on the other side of the main zoo street struck the hour, and just as though it was on a timer, the downpour began in a torrent that would soon shift into a steady drumbeat which would last until dark. A blast of cool air freshened the little room but did nothing to relieve the tension. Brother Daniel pressed his lips together and returned to his desk. He sat down and pulled a sheaf of essays toward him squinting at them in the unsteady light. He picked up his pen but put it down again and glowered at his niece. Her head was turned to the courtyard, her shoulders pulling toward it. Above the noise of the storm, Frere Danielle heard laughter, 
voices giggling as several boys and girls, the latter dressed in alley eyes, and clutching their books above their heads to keep off the rain, raced into the classroom directly across from his cell. A tall, blonde shadow darted in behind them and proceeded to the front. Kim Helm spun back to the desk. May I go, Uncle? She said. The class is starting. A look of impatience flashed across Danielle's face. You've learned enough English, he said. It's time these lessons should stop. Kim Helm gasped in surprise, and Brother Daniel gazed down at his papers again. The words of Kai, his best student, seemed cliched and stilted and the pen hovered above the page, uncertain where first to strike. The room became hot and close once more, and the fragrance of Kim Helm's perfume failed before the musty smell of Danielle's books, the starchy odor of his collar, the sweat souring on his forehead. He glanced up. Kim Helm had turned pale in spite of the rouge she applied to her cheeks, which he had first mistaken for her natural color. May I go, she repeated. He gripped the pen hard, irked by her insistence, and a jet of red ink spurted onto the page beneath him. He let out an exasperated cry, grabbed a cloth, and carefully dried Kai's essay. When he looked up again, Kim Haum was already halfway across the court. Brother Daniel saw that Kai had not arrived yet. He knelt down beside his rose plants, and with a small hand hoe, he gently raked the rich dark loam, a finely ground mixture of peat and kitchen compost surrounding his peace rooms, the first and most cherished of the lot. He examined the soil, running some of it critically through his fingers, then tugged on a seven-leafed sucker, which had sprung up too near the base of the bush and extracted it expertly by the roots. It was early morning. The draft of cold air behind the brothers' residence worried him slightly, but the sweet aroma of the large-flowered Paul Cheville Heartthrob rose, Kai's favorite, exploded in his face like a hothouse bloom. Fair Danielle set down his hoe, peered at the branches of the peace rose, and sighed. Even in the feeble light, he could see that two tiny black spots had cropped up, cropped up overnight on yet another leaf, which he now picked off between his thumb and forefinger. His mouth hardened with aggravation as he peeked over the stone wall, which screamed, La Santa Verre off from Hagachum Street, and the world. On top of a tall bamboo scaffold across the street, several Vietnamese men worked away on the seventh floor of the new high rise. A maximum security American billet, which towered above the school. Inside the half built structure, carpenters' hammers rang out. Somewhere in the distance, an electric saw buzzed. Closer in, a lathe bird. Two white-suited workers carrying a girder angled in and out of the drywall rooms of a large apartment, pith helmets on their heads to protect them from the sun. The smell of wood chips, mortar, and lime showered down on the cleric as the men dropped the heavy girder with a clunk and wiped their sweaty brows. Sun, when had he or his flowers last seen enough of that? I'm sorry I'm late, brother, Kai said, hurrying up to him completely out of breath. The boy's cravat was awry, his collar was unbuttoned, and a crumb from his breakfast still stuck to his mouth. He glanced down at his heartthrob and cried out in dismay. He took one of the salmon pink flowers in his hand and plucked off an aphid that had crawled up from the branch, which was beginning to show unmistakable signs of fungus. The lack of light is killing it, brother, he complained, removing several other insects. What are we to do? Brother Daniel gazed at the construction across the street again and didn't answer. The day before, he looked up at the end of the hour from the papers he was grading to the classroom on the other side of the courtyard. His progress had been slow, his mind distracted by the memory of his unsatisfactory interview with Kim Hong. After the lesson ended, she remained behind and waited for Kai and the other students to leave, then walked out with the teacher. The tall American stood dangerously close to her, like the sucker which had threatened his peace room. Kim Hal riveted her eyes on the man as he bent over her and whispered something. And she did not look even once at her uncle observing her sadly from his cell. Brother, I don't know what fees, I just don't know. Fair Danielle reached up and snapped off another damaged leaf. On top of the new billet, the hammers now rattled like a well-disciplined rifle battery. 
Brother Daniel watched as a yellow caterpillar crane operated by an American grabbed a huge section of concrete wall and gingerly lifted it off the ground. The big farm machine belched out a plume of black smoke and inched its way forward. And the cleric leaned over his peace rose to shield it from the noxious fumes. The crane driver maneuvered around the scaffolding and reached the building at last. The workers seized the section of wall and guided it into place, and Frere Daniel looked on grimly as the fifth floor began to take shape. He peered down at his piece rose again. Another square inch of the bush had faded into the shadows like a planet on slow eclipse. He sighed a second time and gazed at Kai. What is that concept? The boy turned crimson and inverted his eyes. Saturday, brother. His voice barely rose above the din across the street. Fred Daniel raked the ground thoughtfully with his hoe. After a minute, he glanced up. Tell that teacher I want to see him in my room. Today, after class. He scrambled to his feet and shook the dirt off his hands with a rapid swishing of the palms. Kai stared at him. Are you sure, brother? He asked, his voice filled with alarm. Fred Daniel looked at him sharply. Tell him. They had come south together in September of 1954. When the Catholic refugees, Danielle, Kim Hau, her parents, and her younger brother, Kak, among them, fled Hanoi after the French left and the Viet Minh took over the north, the cleric and his niece became separated from the rest in Haiphong. Kim Hau was five, and Danielle had just graduated from the Christian Brothers Ceremony in the seminary in Hanoi. His was the last class to do so. Kim Hong cried and cried and desperately clutched her uncle's hand as they watched her parents' freighter steam away without them. Shut in by a sudden typhoon which swirled in off of Hainan Island, they had to wait another two days to sail. When the moment arrived, Fred Daniel and his clerical guard hoisted the girl in his arms and approached the gangplank of a big American cargo ship under the watchful eyes of a couple of North Vietnamese soldiers, Ho Chi Minh's new conquerors. Dirty brown bilge water gushed from a pipe on one of the lower decks into the garbage strewn harbor. The stench of decayed seaweed, and fuel oil from the already churning engines of their unwashed fellow passengers as they all crowded nervously together at the foot of the gangway, rose in Fred Daniel's nostrils and made him wince. One of the communist soldiers scowled at him, and Brother Daniel held his niece tight, as he might have clutched a sacred relic and quickly carried her on board. Uncle, the child whispered as soon as he set her down on the deck. Who are they? Her tiny wooden sandals clopped on a steel framework as she turned it. At first he thought she meant the soldiers, but then he saw several huge sailors on the quarterdeck in front of them. Their uniforms were immaculate, spotless, white as ivory, and their brightly polished shoes glittered in the morning light. They hurried about the deck helping the frightened, poorly clad Vietnamese with a self-assurance and efficiency that brother Daniel failed to intimidate, and he felt mortified for his people as he noticed the contrast. The frail old woman laden down by her belongings slipped suddenly and cried out, and one of the sailors leaped forward, grabbed her by the elbow, and effortlessly relieved her of her burden. He flashed her a smile as bright as the sun, and Kim Howell clung to her uncle's cassock and gaped at the marvelous man in wide-eyed wonder. Fair Daniel set his mouth hard. They are Americans, child, he said. He took her by the hand and steered her toward an open hatchway off to their left. They say they are here to help us, but I have my doubts. Why would anyone want to help us? Two of them were fast approaching, however, and Brother Daniel watched them apprehensively. But then he tripped on the hatch combing, and he let go of Kim Hong's hand and clawed frantically at the rail. The girl screamed in terror, struck out with her foot, and plunged down into the darkness. Kim Hong! Brother Daniel yelled, his voice gripped with horror. He seized the rail and stumbled down the stairs. It's okay, little one, a voice said, I've got you. Kim Hong sniveled in the arms of an American. Fair Daniel stared up into a face as strange and flat as the bewildering monotone the man had used with his niece. Although the words themselves were familiar to him from long years of study at the seminary. The sailor towered above him, and Brother Daniel felt small and insignificant beside him. The American's aftershave gave off the cleanest scent he ever inhaled, and the cleric felt dirty as well. He was mortified again, this time for himself. 
I take her now, he said coldly, stretching his hand out toward his niece. Kim Helm clung to the American, and she dug her tiny fingers into his large, muscular forearm. She gave her uncle a look of reproach, then buried her tear-stained cheek in the sailor's massive shoulder. It's okay, little one, the man said again. You had quite a fall, eh? You give her now, Fair Danielle ordered. He turned to his niece, but Kim Helm only burrowed deeper into the American's shoulder. The sailor laughed merrily. Who don't cry now, he coaxed, letting her down gently on the deck. She struggled to climb back up into his arms, but the man stepped back and fished for something in his pocket. Look! He brought out a small, colorful package which smelled of coconut and almonds. The child stopped sniffling and stared at the package with eager eyes. Brother Daniel shook his head, but Kim Hound reached her hand out. Tet, the only time for candy, was still four months away. No thanks, the cleric said, interposing his hand between theirs. He scooped Kim Helm up and rudely turned his back on the American. Kim Helm kicked at him in protest as he bore her away. Brother Daniel's face burned with shame. How dare the man bribe her like that? He plodded along the car with no idea where he was going, ignoring the sailor's astonished exclamations behind him and the renewed wailings of his niece. You wanted to see me? Brother Daniel glanced up from his grating and focused hard on the darkened doorway. The monsoon had turned the late afternoon into night. Rain clattered on the rooftop, and the battered aluminum lamp beside his writing table smoked dreadfully and gave off the pungent smell of kerosene. The electric generator, powering the brothers' residence, had broken down the minute the storm began. The American teacher stole into view and then stopped, as though unsure how to meet a holy man in his cell. Fair Danielle sensed his advantage and sprang to his feet. I will be terre à terre, monsieur, he said crisply. It's about my niece. The American remained where he was, but shifted his rain-soaked books from one arm to the other. He looked to be about 23 and was even taller than Danielle had imagined. He'd been drenched by his sprint across the courtyard, but he held his head high and gazed placidly at the cleric in spite of the latter's abrupt announcement. Brother Daniel was dispirited by the man's height and quickly pointed to a simple wooden chair across from his desk. Please, he said, vexed that his hand shook. The man advanced into the room and sat down. He placed his books, English for Today and a workbook, on the corner of the desk. Brother Daniel sat down as well. The American's clothes smelled damp, but the rain had not been able to wash out his air of self-confidence or the powerful scent of his aftershave. Frere Danielle was more disconcerted than ever. Your niece? The cleric rose up in his chair and leveled his eyes at the visitor. Outside, the wind picked up, and the rain pounded the pavement and swirled in rivulets into the gutters. The odor of sodden leaves drooping from the capot tree filled Brother Daniel with sadness. She is so young, you see, 17, still a child. I'm sure you, who is your niece? Fair Daniel started and gazed suspiciously at his guest, trying to read his mind. His heart vacillated between hope and fear. Kim Hong, Janti Kim Hong, she's in your class. Ah, yes, Miss Hong, the man said with a smile, the one who wears jeans. A deep frown creased Brother Daniel's brow. Just so, he snapped. The American raised his eyebrows at the cleric's curtness, and Fair Daniel and climbed his shoulders forward as though to apologize. She is quite susceptible, he went on, more mildly. Her parents died in a typhoon when we were coming south in 1954, and then I had to place her in a sister's residence in Dachau. She couldn't live here with me, of course. He paused, but the American didn't say anything. I'm afraid she gets very little guidance there, however. He shook his head and waited again, but the American still said nothing. I do not want her to be led astray, monsieur, he added, a trace of annoyance creeping back into his tone. Kim Hum is a good girl, vous savez, but not very worldly. His lips parted in a thin smile which froze at the American's unexpected response. She's a pretty girl, too, a very pretty girl. The wing moaned against the casement, bringing with it the smell of the rain-swept courtyard. Brother Daniel felt a chill and rose from his desk. His voice suddenly became harsh. 
Monsieur, I cannot allow my niece to be subjected to corrupting influences, and I must therefore insist that you leave her alone. I have seen the way you take on with her. You cannot just come here and do whatever you please, you know. The American shot to his feet, clearly offended. I am her teacher, he said, and you have no right to insult me. If you think that I don't, Fair Danielle cut him off. Please leave this room, he said, immediately. The American looked shocked, and the color drained from his face. Brother Daniel could not trust himself to point at the door, so he moved around the desk instead and ushered his visitor out. He lingered on the threshold until the man stomped through the gate into Wanted Williams Hoo Street and strode away, his head unbowed by the driving rain. Then he turned and trudged back to his desk. Uncle, how could you? Brother Daniel fingered another dying bloom on his peace rose and did not glance up. He shifted uncomfortably, however, as Kim Holm, her voice choking, stepped forward and repeated her lament. Kai, who was standing nearby tending his Paul Cherville, flushed and looked away. How could you talk with him about me? It's disgraceful. The day was sweltering already, and storm clouds hovered on the horizon, ready to burst. The air was oppressive, and Fair Danielle's roses sagged forlornly and gave off the odor of faded perfume. Clark longed for the end of the monsoon season. The incessant rains laden with pollution from the American war machine brought him and his flowers no comfort. But the end was still very far away. He gazed up at his niece at last. Speaking of disgraceful, look how you're dressed. He plucked the leg of her jeans as though he was picking off another dead leaf from his piece of it. Kim Helm sprang back from him. He says you wrote him and demanded I transfer to old man Duke's class. Well, I won't do it. Her voice choked up again, and tears welled in her eyes. Brother Daniel's mouth twitched with anger. How dare you be so disrespectful, he cried. He heard a rustle among the flowers and glared at Kai, who drew away from his heartthrob and tried to make himself scarce among the other roses. At least old man Duke is a Vietnamese. He was shaking all over now, and to calm himself, he picked up his hoe and dug a hole around the base of his peace rose to give it more breathing room. The hoe struck an object, and he reached down into the hole and brought it up into the light. It looked like a rusted rifle bullet, but he couldn't be sure. In February 1859, the French had attacked the Saigon Citadel. The eastern wall of La Saint-Tabert was contiguous with one of the inner walls of the fortress. The citadel had fallen within hours, and Saigon had been under the thumb of one foreigner after another ever since. Brother Daniel stared at the object, disheartened, and then threw it angrily away. He turned back to his niece. I forbid you to go to this concert today, he said. Instead, you will return to the convent and discard those clothes, and on Monday you will go to Master Duke, properly dressed. Do you understand? Kim Hong looked stunned for a moment, and then she wheeled and stormed away without a word. Her sandals slapped the garden flagstones as she disappeared. Fair Daniel drew in a heavy breath and slowly released it. He bent forward and started to dig another hole around the base of his peace rose, but he soon gave it up and tossed down his hoe. Across the street, a buzz saw him on. Kai puttered anxiously among the dying flowers. As the afternoon drew to a close, Brother Daniel found it increasingly difficult to concentrate on the few remaining papers he had left to grade. The saws and hammers hemmed him in on both sides now, from the American billet at his back and the sound stage to his front. The CBC concert was to begin in 15 minutes. In the middle of the courtyard, right under the K-pop tree, a knot of workers hurried back and forth, putting the finishing touches to the platform on which the band was to perform. At the front of the stage, a simple red and yellow South Vietnamese flag fluttered along an American one. The stars of the ladder covered over by a large white, white peace sign on a black background. The odor of eucalyptus wood, the grinding of the last board, and the shouts of the workers filtered past Danielle's door. On the far side of the platform, the four band members, young Vietnamese with long stringy hair, bell bottoms, and garishly colored t-shirts, warmed up on their electric guitars, piano, and drum set. The teeth jarring wheel of an American rock tune filled the corridor. Brother Daniel scowled and massaged his sore forehead. He put his pen down and tramped out the door. I only have about another 25 pages. I hope you can bear with it. Just kidding. <laughs> the last worker of the The irritating music stopped, and the wrought iron gate of the school compound squealed back on its hinges. Hundreds of impatient teenagers dashed into the courtyard and streamed toward the stage. 
They were all dressed in jeans now, the boys in shirts, the girls in blouses. They swarmed around Fair Danielle but appeared hardly to notice him. The smell of their excited bodies rose above the sweet aroma of the capon tree. Brother Daniel watched them scornfully as they milled about beneath the stage. How avidly they'd all succumbed to this filthy foreign trash. He thought of his own youth and of the musicians in his village who had played traditional native folk songs on their sound flutes, tambours, and balloon guitars. Songs of resistance, valor, love of country, fathers and kings. He wheeled away in disgust and ran right into Kai. She's here, brother, the boy said in a pained voice. Look. Ferdinand turned and followed his gaze. He spotted the American first, overshadowing the crowd, edging his way forward. The cleric glowered at the man as he moved close to the stage, and then he shrank back in astonishment. At the American's side, blushing, but firmly gripping his hand, was Kim Hull. Brother Daniel stepped toward them just as the lead singer, a boy with a mustache and with his hair now tied in a ponytail to keep it away from his guitar, strode to the front of the stage. Thank for coming, he yelled in English into a microphone. We start with Beatles song. She love you. The crowd applauded wildly, and the singer launched into the tune. The rest of the band took up the beat, and the crowd swayed back and forth to the music. Brother Daniel plunged in among them, batting away the swirling bodies and homing in on the American and his niece. Ecstatic voices everywhere sang along with the band, and discordant, unfamiliar noises made the cleric's ears ache. For a moment he lost sight of them, and then he halted when they came into view again at the very foot of the stage. The American had his arms twined around Kim Hong and held her tight. The girl nuzzled against his chest. Her uncle looked on in anguish as she rose up on her toes and pressed her cheek affectionately into the man's shoulder. The American caressed her hair and Kim Hong dropped back down on her feet and flashed him a joyful smile. Brother Daniel felt a spasm in his chest as though his heart had lurched to a sudden stop. He stared helplessly at the happy couple for a few seconds while young people jostled and buffeted him on all sides as if he was of no consequence. Then he turned on his heels and hobbled away toward his cell. Beneath the alcove of the brothers' residence, Kai lorded with a group of other young men. Red-faced with rage, the boy whispered rapidly to his comrades and pointed in the direction of the stage. <coughs> One of the other Vietnamese youths nodded and bunched his fists. Fur Daniel marched up to them. Do not even think of it, he said sternly. For the love of your maker, you will do nothing. Do you hear me? The boy who had punched his fist immediately relaxed them. Yes, mon frère, he murmured. Frere Daniel wheeled to Kai, who shuffled on his feet. Do, do you hear? Kai bit his lip, and a look of utter misery crossed his face. Yes, brother, he muttered. He quickly stalked away, and the others followed after him. Brother Daniel gazed disconsolately at his cell. The CBC had started a set of songs by someone the lead singer called Jefferson Airplane, and the horrific sounds were enough to drive him mad. He knew he could do no grading now, and so he crept to the end of the long building to find refuge among his flowers. The loud noises persecuted him even here, but he feasted his eyes on his peace rose and sought solace from its few remaining blooms. He glanced at the heartthrob next to it and started. The head had been snapped clean off. Fur Daniel was overcome with sorrow. The dead plant reminded him of all the Vietnamese revolutionaries decapitated by the French for resisting their convoys. Another yowling line of hideous American music burst upon his ears and he looked back at the peace rose and tenderly fingered a fading blossom that was just beginning to turn brown. A swatch of tarpaulin protecting the building across the street snapped in the wind, and he lifted his head and glared at the big American villa. The workers had been busy all day and had made great progress on the eighth floor. When the morning returned, Brother Daniel knew he would find a little less sun left to cheer his peace rooms, and he bowed his head in dejection. Gradually, of course, the foreigners were taking the mat away from him, and then what would he do? A wave of panic swept over him as he saw himself tumbling headlong into a terrifying black hole, but with no one at the bottom to catch him. He shuddered violently, and then, when the fear subsided, he leaned forward, pressed his thumb against his forefoot, and plucked the blossom off the dying rose. <laughs>